All right. Good morning and welcome to Global Healthcast. Today we cover various topics and with me as always is Dr. Melvin Sanekas. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Professor, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those who are watching us or listening to us today. We cover four topics today. Approval of a gene therapy for sickle cell disease. And we cover colorectal cancer risk in drug-negative drug patients with type 2 diabetes. And I will cover infants exposed to COVID-19 in utero and how climate change may increase infectious diseases. With that, we start with the program right away. Melvin, what is the story on the FDA approval of cell-based gene therapies? Yes, so this is very interesting. The US FDA approved two cell-based gene therapies. Um, one is called CASGEVI and the other is called uh, LifeGenia, um, both for sickle cell disease. Um, CASGEVI is the first FDA approved therapy utilizing CRISPR-Cas9 technology for the treatment of sickle cell disease in patients 12 years of age and older. Um, and LifeGenia, which uses a, a different technology, it's a lentiviral vector for genetic modification, is also approved for treatment of patients 12 years of age and older with sickle cell disease. Um, CASGEVI is very interesting because it's given to increase production of fetal hemoglo hemoglobin, which prevents the sickling of red cells, red blood cells. Um, with the other one, LifeGenia, the patient's blood stem cells are genetically modified to produce a gene therapy derived hemoglobin that functions similarly to hemoglobin A. Both treatments are administered as one-time infusions and they are made from the patient's own blood stem cells, which are then modified and returned to the patient in a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Um, and the, the reason why uh, we wanna talk about this today, especially uh, CASGEVI, is because this is really the first gene therapy um, treatment approved for, um, for anything. And we have been hearing this since decades ago, right? That in the future, we will be able to do gene therapy. Um, and now we are in the future. Yeah, now we're in the future is today. Very yeah. good, yeah. And look, um, I remember particularly when I worked in the United States, there were many patients with sickle cell disease and they are at high risk for certain infectious diseases like with Babesia, but also with the pneumococcus or encapsulated bacteria in general. So this is really, really good news and uh, it will reduce a lot of suffering around the globe. It, it is very, yes, very I good news. It's very good news, Professor, but I just wanted to say that the one thing that everyone is talking about is the access for these drugs because these drugs are over $2 million each. Oh my God. Yeah. Yep. So uh, it will not be of public health benefit at this point, but this point, as always, yes. uh, like with the telephones and like with other technologies, it is a question of time until prices come down. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, $2 million per patient is, is really a very proud price, as we would say in German, yeah. Mm -hmm. Melvin, you have another very nice topic on uh, here on this colorectal, colorectal cancer. C can you explain yeah. this? This is also very interesting because um, we have been hearing about the GLP-1 receptor agonists. They are very uh, popular these days because they treat diabetes and they also make you lose weight, right? So it's very uh, convenient, right? Um, but this study is also really um, useful, I would say, and it might also be helpful for public health as well, because we know that being overweight and uh, obesity is, these two are major risk factors for colorectal cancer as well, right? Um, and the authors of this study from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, uh, they hypothesized that the GLP-1 receptor agonists are also associated with a decreased risk for colorectal cancer in patients with type 2 diabetes. And they conducted a nationwide retrospective cohort study among drug-naive patients with type 2 diabetes comparing GLP-1 receptor agonists with seven non-GLP-1 RA antidiabetics, including metformin, including insulin, um, which are also suggested to influence uh, colorectal cancer. And basically what they have 
shown in the study is that there is a an association between um, GLP-1 RA use with reduced colorectal cancer risk, and and so it's it's very interesting to see, and hopefully more studies will be done in this, and and hopefully this can really be used more by people so that the incidence of colorectal cancer will uh, also reduce. Yes, and it would also mean there is a reduction of for the need for doing uh, colonoscopies, right? Screening yeah. every seven years or whatever the recommendation in your country may be. So two good, two excellent pieces of news in one week, really breakthrough, very nice. Thanks for bringing this up. This is a study based on a cohort of Brazilian infants um, showing that those who were exposed to SARS-CoV-2 infection in, in the womb may be at increased risk for developmental delays in the first year of life. So I think this is very important because um, it, it really shows, uh, it, it really confirms studies conducted in the US and elsewhere showing also a risk of delay in infants exposed to COVID infection in utero. But this is the first to look at the study in, in Brazil. Um, and the, in, in a follow-up of exposed infants, the researchers found that 10% had an abnormal result on cranial ultrasonography, mainly mild ventriculomegaly and a swelling of the brain caused by uh, cerebrospinal fluid. But it is something that um, we don't want kids to have, right? So I, I think it's also another reason for mothers to get vaccinated um, before they, they get pregnant because vaccination with the COVID vaccines will not only protect the mothers, protect the infants in utero, but also protect them from delays, developmental delays in the first year of life. Um, third piece of good news, um, you or what we know already, you should get vaccinated with uh, the COVID-19 vaccine if you are pregnant. And I think yeah. this is a very important uh, piece of information as well to support vaccination during pregnancy. Yeah, thanks Melvin for bringing this up. Uh, what I have today is a short summary on prevention and therapy of acute respiratory tract infections, ARI. And the most common organism causing respiratory tract infections repeatedly, basically you can have it even within one season several times, is the rhinovirus. That is number one. Usually rhinovirus diseases are mild, but uh, some may be more, um, more severe and you may even have complications, particularly if two viruses infect uh, the human body, rhinovirus plus another one, or if rhinovirus and the bacterium are coming together to cause disease. So rhinovirus, right now there's nothing much we can do and they cause repeated infections. For the RS virus, for the respiratory syncytial virus, as of 2023, the good news is there are two vaccines out there for the elderly, people 60 plus, and uh, there is one active vaccination for uh, vaccination in pregnancy. And there is one monoclonal antibody. And all three products are licensed and recommended in the United States. And likely the licensures and recommendations will follow in, in other countries. Just as, uh, as uh, to remind everybody, usually you get a vaccine recommendation if the incidence of a disease is 100 per 100,000 or one per thousand. This RSV incidence in the first year of life is one per 50, not per thousand. So this is really a huge success and it took 10 years to develop those vaccines with a breakthrough innovation some 10 years ago. So this is really, really good news for young children. For influenza A and B, there are medications out there. There are many vaccines out there. We spoke frequently about SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that are out there. There are also at least two medications available. For the other respiratory viruses like enterovirus, metanomavirus, parainfluenza viruses, and adenoviruses, there is no treatment and no vaccine at this point. But for bacteria, there are some vaccines and also some therapies. And I just want to summarize this has been really a very good research with the licensure of new products, with uh, particularly with the RS vaccines that are now available 
And uh, it is really a great piece of research and very, very welcome by public health in many countries. Melvin, any views from your perspective? I think this is a very useful summary, Professor. And, you know, just to remind us that there are so many other viruses out there, some with um, therapies and prevention, some without. So um, for me, what I'm, I always tell people is that if you want an extra layer of protection, especially during the flu and winter season, wear a mask if you're outside. I think it helps. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I have one more topic to cover, and that is infectious diseases and climate change. Now, I only want to explain one mechanism how climate change may increase the number of infectious diseases. I do not cover tick or mosquito related diseases, only I cover organisms that have to do or where water plays an important role. Why water? If the temperature rises in our environment, the air can hold more water. Warm water can, warm air holds more water than cold air. Everybody knows this, right? Now, that means that there may be more heavy precipitation. More heavy precipitation results, may result in fecal contamination by the sewage of domestic animals and of wild animals, and the sewage goes into the surface water in the rivers. Water treatment plants may be flooded and they are contaminated and there may be a combined sewer overflow. And then the organisms like cryptosporidium may make it into the drinking water and result in an outbreak. Or second mechanism, the preobulnificus causes severe septicemia, particularly in patients with liver diseases. Now there is an increased temperature the sea surface temperature increases, and this is why Vipirvo vinificus can more easily replicate to high concentrations in prekish water. Humans are exposed when bathing there, and then you may have an outbreak and cases in, uh, due to this mechanism. There is one other, two other mechanisms, Viprio cholera, the, the, the cause of cholera. Heavy presentation again, results in a storm surge with a rise of sea levels. And at the same time, there may be due to warming propagation of survival of pathogens. And that may all re result in contamination of and dispersion of surface water and latrines or in other sewage containers. Uh, sewage may make it into the surface water and finally to the drinking water. And this results in an outbreak. And finally, interestingly, leptospira. Leptospira you find in the urine of infected rats. Now, with increased and heavy precipitation, this urine may go into the soil and may go, may be mobilized into the open sewers that are contaminated. And again, due to heavy precipitation, it may go to floodwaters and uh, disperse. Uh, to the drinking water and cause outbreaks. So these are four examples how an increase of the environmental temperature may result in outbreaks due to pathogens that you find in water. Melvin, any comments from your side? I mean, right now we have the Dubai um, World Climate Conference and we're all waiting for the final declaration. I have not heard it yet. But uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Two things. So I, I think this is pretty clear for us in the, in the medical and scientific field now. But I think most people are not yet really, um, they have not really absorbed this kind of messaging that really shows us that climate change and more diseases uh, it, are actually both bad news for, for everyone. And I think um this message has to um be said regularly yeah. all the time until everyone um sees the, the issue here and secondly um you mentioned the conference in dubai it's funny because i i've been looking at comments on on twitter which is now called x right and and people are saying that this meeting in dubai is also very interesting because it's where a lot of people have flown to this conference um, and you, you see the, the, the big 
irony in in the meetings in what they're trying to accomplish and what they are doing at the moment so i think yeah yeah so you use a lot of uh, or you produce a lot of co2 which you want to avoid but they are meeting in large groups in dubai right yes yes <laughs> and the people who talk about uh, th these uh, international health people talking about saving the planet and reducing co2 are flying everywhere around the world to talk about it yeah yeah Melvin, thank you very much. I think this is what we covered today. The approval of a cell-based gene therapy for sickle cell disease, actually two approvals. We heard about GLP-1RA associated with reduced colorectal cancer. Very good news. We heard about infants exposed to COVID-19 in utero and that they are at increased risk for developmental delays in the first year of life. And I talked about acute respiratory tract infections and I summarized what uh, we where we are today with regard to therapies and vaccines and i gave you four examples how climate change may increase infectious diseases now and in the future with this thank you very much for listening we meet again next week and goodbye for now yes thank you very much everyone stay safe